How many people love Jesus? Yeah. Amen. I am always, always blessed to have a chance to talk to men. Like Pastor Dan said a minute ago, we are the tip of the spear. We are the blunt object that God has ordained into the world to change nations, to change lives. That's us. We're supposed to be the head of our families. We're supposed to be the head of our marriages. We're supposed to be the point people that God depends upon when the chips are on the line. So we're going to talk about some of this stuff tonight. So before we do this, let's pray and then you can have a seat. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together here tonight. We thank you, Lord, for all of us that have gathered and assembled in this solemn assembly here this evening to be refreshed and edified and instructed concerning operations in the future as we move forward around the world in the name of Jesus. This is a military operation, and we thank you, Lord, for uh, guidance and for strength to obey the commands that have been given and the commands that will not be rescinded in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for this church. We thank you, Lord, for the outreach of this church and for all of the men representing the, the, the foundation and platform for why this church is even here. We thank you, Lord, that we will have eyes to see and ears to hear from Scripture tonight, that we will leave the service stronger in spirit when we come in here and better equipped to represent you, Lord, with excellence wherever we are sent in your name. And so we praise and we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Everybody that agrees with that said together, amen. amen. Take your seats. Thank you. As I said a moment ago, um, I enjoy, very much, I enjoy having the opportunity to preach to men, speak to men, and encourage them. In the Philippines, you may or may not know this, but, you know, I hold the rank of Brigadier General in the Philippine Army. I'm a commissioned officer in the Philippine Army, not the U.S., but the Philippines. My wife holds the position of Lieutenant Colonel. We are chaplain officers in the Philippine Army. So I have a chance to go on to the military bases and represent Jesus to the soldiers that in many cases are going out on military operations into uh, hot zones and the compromised areas of the country where their lives could be at risk, depending upon what they encounter out there. And so we have meetings, and the base commanders know us, and they know that we're going to give it to them straight before they go. And so we talk frankly to these people about the fact that there's a heaven and there's a hell. And by the end of the day, you might be in one or the other forever. So you better get your act together while you have a chance to do so. And as a result, you know, uh, people, you know, it's amazing how people will you know, suddenly be open-minded when the threat of death is staring them in the face. And uh, suddenly they're interested in things you have to say. And the, the, the problem with a lot of people in this country, in a country like this, and even in churches, even like ours here this evening, is that they're not faced with such choices. They're not faced with such, you know, uh, uh, you know absolutes. Let's put it that way, absolutes. But we need to understand, and we need to understand that in the last days, our sword needs to be as sharp as it can possibly be for the race that we are running. Because the challenges that we are going to be facing, if you think it's rough now, hide and watch should Jesus tarry. You're going to have to know some things about who you are and who you represent and who stands by your side and who lives inside of you. The Bible says the greater is he in you than he that's in the world. Well, it's about time that above all men of God act like, talk like, and live like they actually believe that. Because the world desperately needs to see the real deal, the real body of Christ, not these Sunday morning wannabes, okay, but the real deal, the real men and women of God. But here tonight, the men of God. So we're going to do some things tonight about how we um, sharpen the sword the way it needs to be sharpened and keep it that way for the long haul, for the race that we're running for the name of Jesus. Okay, I've been running now for Jesus for 41 years in the Philippines and 43 years serving the Lord. Got saved in September of 1978, and we've been running our race ever since. And we went over, I went over to the Philippines uh, in September of 1980 with $20 in my pocket and a one-way ticket and no way back. And there was no guarantee that anybody would even be there to meet me when I landed on the other side of the world. So as we flew across the Pacific that night, it was a night flight, left LAX at 10 p.m. to arrive in Manila at 5 a.m. next day. 
And uh, as that plane through the, through, flew through the night, I'm, I had a window seat. I'm looking out the window. You know, it's pitch black out there. You don't see anything. And I was spending 12 hours praying in tongues. From the time that plane departed to the time it landed, I prayed in the Spirit because I was taking a step of faith into the unknown. And really, for me, it was the unknown. I had written letters to the ministry that I was sent by the Holy Spirit to go join up with. He never answered my letters. He got them. He told me later he received my letters. I wrote three times while I was a student at Rama. Three times I wrote him and never got an answer. Told him I heard, I heard from the Lord, you know, and I believe that God was sending me there and, and uh, you know, uh, be there to meet me. You know, how about that? That'd be nice. And, uh, you know, well, never heard back. So I, when I left LAX, I had no idea if anybody was even going to be there to meet me. I was hoping and praying that there would be, but I didn't know. And so when that flashing light, boarding now, started flashing at the LAX airport, Tom Bradley International Terminal, I sat there and I said, this is the moment of truth for me. If I get on that plane, there's no turning back. And I don't know what's on the other side of the world, and I don't have much money. I have $20 and my foot locker notes from Bible school and no way back to the U.S. Back then you could buy one-way tickets. You can't do that now, but you could back then. And I prayed for 12 hours on that flight across the Pacific. And when I landed, you know, there was no one there to meet me. Just at the bottom of the staircase were two Philippine Marines with Uzi submachine guns going through the carry-on baggage of the passengers looking for plastic explosives, bombs, and guns. That's the, I flew into a country under martial law at that time. Okay. Now, I say all of these things not to have you think of me as some kind of impressive military figure, but what I have found in 41 years of serving Jesus, if you don't adopt a military mentality to the race you're running, you're not going to make it to the finish line. You're not. You may be a body left in a chair somewhere, but you're not going to be of any effect for the kingdom of God. And I would, I would assume that you're here tonight because you want something from God, because you need something from the Lord. And I'm here to tell you that the Holy Spirit is ready to give you whatever you came to get. But you have to change your attitude. You have to change your entire mindset about who you are and where you're going and what you're going to do while you're running this race in the name of Jesus. Can anyone say Amen. Can anyone say hua? Again, hua. Hua. See, you are, you are military men, and you're on maneuvers, and you're on assignment from God. And you better understand what's going on out there because this is a world at war that you and I were born into. Born into a world at war. I mean, I've seen pastors come and go. I've seen churches rise and fall. I made a, I made a commitment to the Lord when I started. I will finish this race. I'm going to make my mistakes along the way. We're all works in progress, but I'll be at the finish line. You can count on me, Lord. When the dust settles, I'll be there for you. And you have to make that same kind of quality decision in your life as well. Look with me at the Gospel of Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter number 5. Let me see where we want to begin. Just uh, to paraphrase a little bit here. Jesus has been summoned to Jairus' house, a ruler of the synagogue, because he's been told that this little girl of his is dying. And so he's going to go. Let's see, verse number 35. He's talking to a woman that has just been healed of an issue of blood. Okay, and then while he's talking to her, it says in the 35th verse from Mark chapter 5, while he was still speaking... Some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, Your daughter is dead. Why do you trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word, he, or that was spoken, as soon as he heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. Now, verse 37, And he permitted no one to follow him except... Notice the three that he went with him, or went with him, I should say. He permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. So these three, the three out of 12, were called alongside. He left the other nine where they were and said, wait for me here, I'll be back. And he took Peter, James, and John. Okay. Then it says in verse 38, then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, Why do you make this commotion and weep? 
the child is not dead, but sleeping. And verse number 40, look at the reaction. They ridiculed him. Okay, so they're laughing at him. In the Greek, the, the word ridicule comes from a Greek word that means they were uh, laughing, they were deriding him. They were making fun of him as they were laughing. It was a contemptuous kind of laughter. Okay, they were deriding him. Who do you think you are coming in here so be, so being so, you know, insensitive to the parents and to the family? Look, I mean, the kid's dead. How dare you come in here and say she's only sleeping, et cetera, et cetera. They were deriding him like that. Notice what it says at the, at the second part of verse number 40. It says, but when he had put them all outside, when he had put them all outside, all of the ridiculing, laughing, mocking people, he put them out, and he goes, he takes the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him. Now, those who were with him would be Peter, James, and John, those three. He took them and the parents into the room where the dead body was on the bed. He entered in where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, they were overcome with great amazement, but he commanded them strictly that no one should know it, but that something should be given to her for eating, to eat, something to eat. Okay. He put them all out. Okay. The title, if you want to title tonight's message, is you need to put people out of your life. You need to put them all out. If you're going to run your race, if you're going to be successful with military operations in the name of Jesus, wherever the Holy Spirit sends you, you're going to have to put people out of your life. You're going to have to get rid of all of the dead weight, and you're going to have to streamline your walk with God in such a way like you've never been streamlined before. Okay, And you're going to have to hold yourself to an excellent standard, a high standard of excellence that you monitor in your own life. You won't have to depend upon Pastor Jim, Pastor Dan, some dude on TV, the missionary. You set for yourself a high standard of excellence that you hold yourself to because you've done what is necessary to take and objectively analyze the people of influence in your life. And if they're not drawing you closer to the Lord, if they're not helping you sharpen your sword and keeping it sharp for Jesus, you're going to love them and you're going to dump them in the name of Jesus and move on and find some new friends. Because if those, if those people are not drawing you closer to the Lord, they are not your friends. Well, they're my hunting buddies. Well, they're my shooting buddies. Well, they're my... No, if they're not drawing you closer to the Lord, they're nobody's buddies except the devil's. Jesus got rid of all the unbelief and the compromise around him. You are going to have to do the same. You're going to have to shorten up your friends list. You're going to have to take a good hard look at who your friends are, the people of influence in your life, and you're going to have to make some choice decisions here. You're going to have to love some people and dump them. You can love them from a distance, but you, you, you cannot allow them access into your lives anymore. Okay? We tell the soldiers, you better know how to handle your weapons. You better know, you better, you have better, you know, I hope you were paying attention when you were in boot camp. I hope you were paying attention because you're going to have to be out there and you will be shot at. When bullets are flying by, you won't have time to remember it all. You'll have to know these things by rote memory. You'll have to prepare for the encounter before the encounter takes place. Otherwise, you'll be dead meat on the battlefield. We'll have to ship your body home to your family. Okay, so remember now, three guys, three of the disciples went into that room and watched Jesus do what Jesus did. Now, go with me to Acts chapter 9. This is now many years later. Many years later, Jesus has gone back to heaven. He's finished his work, but now he's commissioned the disciples, which will be including us now today, including us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's what we call the Great Commission. Okay, Acts chapter number 9 and verse number, let's see. Um, Verse number 36, we'll read a few verses here just to catch the flow of thought before we highlight the verse I'd like for you to see here tonight. Acts 9, 36. This is Peter, okay? Peter. At Joppa there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. If I was her, I would have hung with Dab Tabitha and dumped the word Dorcas. I mean, just, I don't know. 
maybe it's just me, but what's a nickname for Dorcas? Dork? Whatever. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydda was near to Joppa and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood by him, weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter, what's the next phrase? Put them all out. Now, where did he learn that from? Years and years before, he watched Jesus do this. He was in the room with James and John when, Peter did exa- when Jesus did exactly the same thing when he got rid of all the ridiculers, the, the liars, the laughers, and all of this, got rid of them, and then went in there and did something miraculous for the Lord. And Peter watched it. He was there. And now years later, he's in exactly, almost exactly the same position with this woman, Dorcas, who has died, he is surrounded not by people ridiculing him, but by people weeping and lamenting her departure. And listen, if there was ever a time on this earth where we're surrounded by people weeping and lamenting the life that they're living or the life that they have to put up with, with this COVID garbage and all of this going on around us, with people dying to the left and dying to the right, I've had relatives die, I've had staff members die, I've had pastors die, but you and I, we, he, we need to understand that just like what Esther said in chapter 4 of her book, We were born for such a time as this. This is not a time to hide behind your Bible, honey. This is a time to suck it up, put your helmet back on your head, quit feeling sorry for yourself, pick up your weapons, and re-engage the enemy. Yeah, you don't sit there feeling sorry for yourself. You will get run over by the devil. He will steamroll you. He has no mercy. He'll kill you and kill everybody that is dear to your heart if you let him. But I'm here to torment the devil. He's not here to torment me. I'm here to torment him. When I wake up in the morning, I'm looking for demons to torment. Amen. It's a mindset. It's an attitude. You don't find it in most churches, and you don't find it among the men, whatever that may mean to some people, the men of God. You just don't find it. Okay? You know, there were 12 spies back in the days of Moses. He picked And if you go back and read from Numbers, he picked, these were 12 hand-picked leaders from each tribe. One man from each tribe. Hand-picked leaders. These were not newbies. These were hand-picked, seasoned leaders. Moses hand-picked them and sent them into the promised land to spy it out for 40 days and come back with the intelligence report. Okay, they were sent in on covert operations, check out the land, check out the who's out there, check out their military capabilities, their defenses and all this. Come on back and give us the intelligence report. And they did. Twelve of them went. When they all came back, ten gave an evil report of unbelief. They're saying the the giants are too big. There's nothing we can do. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. Two out of twelve gave the good report, Joshua and Caleb. And they said, no, 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 no. We have a covenant with God. We can go up and take the property. They are bread for us. We can go up and take the land. We have a covenant with God. They don't have a covenant with God, but we do. Amen. Today, proportionally speaking, among the men of God out there, It's two out of 12. Proportionally speaking, for every 12 men of God out there, you've got two that are worth their salt for God. The rest of them are just bodies and chairs, complaining like everybody else, living like everybody else, fearful like everybody else. But the two, he's looking for the two. God's looking for the two. Amen. It's what I call the two battalion. The two battalion. I want to be a member in good standing. How about you? I don't want to be just someone that gets dragged along by their wife to church. It gets dragged along, you know, because they'd really rather be watching some football game somewhere. Listen, I look forward to church because it's a way for me to hear a word that's going to challenge me, hold my fat to the fire, keep my sword sharp. I'm looking forward to coming to services like this. I'm looking forward to this. I can't wait to go to church. Nobody cares. I guarantee nobody cares in hell who's going to win the Super Bowl. Nobody cares in heaven, and nobody cares in hell either. Okay, Peter put them all out, verse number 40. He put them all out, knelt down, and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise, just like what Jesus had done years before. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. 
He saw what Jesus did. He put them all out. And you and I are going to have to put people out because, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 33, evil company corrupts good habits. Evil company corrupts good habits. Now, when we think of evil company, we think of, you know, bad people, criminals, and all this. I got news. Friends of yours that are not drawing you closer to the Lord are evil company to you. You need to see them for what they are. They are tools of the devil to keep you from your potential as a man of God. Okay? Ezekiel chapter 22 talks about God looking for a man among them. One man could have saved that nation from divine judgment. He only needed one. He was looking for a man among them. I want to be a man among them. How about you? I want to be someone God can count on, under fire. I want to be advancing under fire, moving forward. I may be hit. I may be bleeding. I may be wounded. But I'll keep moving forward in the name of Jesus because I know that he'll never leave me nor forsake me in Jesus' name. He's always there for me. Every time I pray, every time I pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit's got something, some words to give to me. Can anyone say amen? I've never gone to pray in tongues and the Spirit of God says, sorry, I don't have any words for you today. Come back tomorrow. I mean, every time I want to pray in tongues, he's got the words to give me to pray. And they're perfect prayers because he's living inside of me. And there's nine gifts of the Spirit. And there's the name of Jesus. And there's the Word of God. All these weapons have been given to us to use. So let's use them. Amen? Let's just not sit around feeling sorry for ourselves, waiting for some politician to solve our problems. Your problems are going to be solved when you have had enough of compromise in your life. You've had enough of the lukewarm, melbatose, milksop lifestyle, and you're going to push the envelope in your life. And you're going to believe God for things you've never believed God for. You're going to challenge yourself in the name of Jesus. Get off your rear end and get in the game and let God be great in your life. Amen. Amen. And if you go to a church like this, you're going to be pushed you'll have your envelope stretched. And that's exactly what church is supposed to do. These cemeteries disguised as churches are nothing more than just, you know, puppet stands for the devil. These people, you probably drove past a dozen churches to get to this one, and I would bet money that they have never heard a message like this in 50 years in that church. But all it takes is one message to turn your life around. Can anyone say amen? amen. Hoo-ah. Hoo-ah. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians 10, verse number 3. Listen, it's in our DNA to lead, okay? Any godly woman on the planet wants to be married to a godly man she can follow. It's in their DNA. They don't want to be the leader, but in many homes they are the leader because the man abdicates his authority and the woman has to pick up the slack. Okay, most churches are run by the women. Most churches have women in leadership positions because the men don't know who they are in Christ. What a tragedy. What a wasted set of potential for all the men in the churches that just do nothing with their entire life but live from football game to football game, baseball game to baseball game. You know, uh, with, 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 with what's at stake? Are you kidding? Heaven and hell forever and ever? And God has chosen to entrust the gospel to people like you and me when heaven and hell is what's at stake here? I mean, people in hell, if they had one more chance to get saved, hell would be emptied in 15 seconds. But they'll never get that chance ever, ever, ever again. And you and I are called by God to be the point people, the frontline fighters, the tip of the spear. What an honor it is to be called by God to be the men of God. Men among them. Glory to God. I love it. I love the challenge. I love it. I love the potential that we can all enjoy because the Holy Spirit lives within us. The third person of the Trinity lives in us. We're the temple of the Holy Ghost. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. See, they knew they were in war. They knew Back then, that this was war. This was lethal warfare, deadly warfare. They knew it. He writes that way. For the weapons, 
of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing. How many high things? Every, every, high, every high thing. That exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing how many thoughts? Every, every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled, okay? Pulling down every high thing, dealing with every thought, bringing every thought into captivity in the name of Jesus, okay? So any thought that comes to you contrary to God's will, any argument that tries to convince you that compromise is acceptable to God, that mediocrity is an acceptable lifestyle for the Lord, you need to move these people out of your life just as quickly as you know how. Mediocrity is not an acceptable lifestyle. Lukewarmness, Jesus said, I'll spit you right out of my mouth. He's looking for the select few out there that he can be great with, and he's looking for you. You were born with a potential. You have a race to run. God has a plan for your life, and it's all good in the hood. But you have to cooperate with the Lord. You can't just cruise in on a Sunday morning every so often and expect God to be great in your life. That kind of mentality doesn't make it anymore. We're living in a world that's been turned upside down. Evil is being called good, and good is being called evil. And honey, in case you don't know this, they're coming after the church. They're coming after you, and they're going to shut you down if they can. And the only way that they cannot do that is if we rise up and say, enough of this. In the name of Jesus, I'm telling you what's going on. You're not telling me what's going on. I'm telling you. I'll dictate the terms of surrender here, not you. Amen. Well, there's going to be people offended. I guarantee they'll be offended, and they need to be offended. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, in the Old Testament, we don't have time to read all this stuff, but I'll just mark it down, okay? 2 Kings chapter 23 deals with King Josiah. You'll also find this in 2 Chronicles 34. But 2 Kings 23, talk, you can read the whole chapter later at your own convenience. You know, the Bible says there were a lot of evil kings back in the day, but there were a few good kings. Not many, but there were a few. But there were only two kings that were called great, only two. Josiah was one of them. Hezekiah was the other. But the reason that these people were called great is the, the good kings tried their best to serve the Lord, but the Bible says they never addressed and tore down the high places. The great kings were the ones who also wanted to serve God, but they also saw the need to go up and tear down the high places. You and I need to put them all out and go after the high places in our lives that are preventing us from being great for God and, and experiencing our potential for the Lord. Can anyone say Amen. Quit looking for excuses to justify your failures because it's all on you, honey. You can't blame somebody else. Well, you know, I was born on the wrong side of the tracks. And, I, you know, we've been telling Filipinos for 40 years, there's nothing wrong with you being a Filipino. Don't, don't look to America and think that somehow you got cheated because you were born over there. You can be just as good for God as anybody in this country or anywhere else on the planet if you want to be because God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't care if you finish your high school education. He doesn't care if you have a doctorate or a diploma. He doesn't care if you make, you know, $10 a year or $10 million a year. He doesn't care. He wants to take you. Listen, look at the 12 apostles. These guys are blue-collar workers. You know, Paul was the educated one. He was the guy, you know, sat at Gamaliel's feet. And, you know, he knew the law backwards and forwards. And he said, you know, compared to my knowledge of Jesus, all that other stuff is garbage. Now all I preach is Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all I care about because all that other stuff is just fluff for me now. Amen. You need to pick up your weapons and you need to learn how to use them. Amen. And the bull, this is a military manual here. The, the Bible is a military manual. It tells you who your enemies are. It tells you what kind of weapons they use. It tells you what kind of weapons you have. It talks about covert operations. It talks about the Holy Spirit, who is our commander-in-chief living within us. Jesus is the commander-in-chief up in heaven. He's the head. We're the body. This is a military operation for the souls of men. That's the target. We're not conquering countries here. We're conquering souls in the name of Jesus. And you need to get in the game and be a participant, praise the Lord. Because if you're not, you're going to get left behind. You're going to get left behind. So I'm going to quickly give you some things tonight, how to get rid of all the idols and the stumbling blocks 
in your life, the high places. Now, what a high place is to you might not be a high place to your neighbor sitting next to you, but it might be to you, and if it is, that's enough to know you need to get rid of it. The high places, okay? We'll talk, there, I'll, I'll give you some examples. I'll, I'll give you six. That doesn't mean it's all that there is. There's others, but these are the six that I find in my travels, in talking to men of God and pastors and etc. These are the ones that I find are the biggest and the most problematic for the, for the men of God that I have to cover. Okay, as Pastor mentioned, we've got a church network between 275 and 300 churches. So I'm always dealing with pastors, dealing with things, okay, and uh, I'll tell you, this is what I've seen in 41 years of serving the Lord on the foreign field, okay? Get rid of all these idols. First of all, it's your responsibility to do this. You can't blame anyone else. You can't say, well, why didn't you help me? You know, listen, when these doors are open, you have a choice to get in your car and drive down here and join up in the service. Is that not true? Yeah. I mean, the doors are open, Okay. And I've had words of prophecy for people over the years, and I've had great words for God, you know, but I've never had a word for the guy that didn't show up. Never had a word for the guy that didn't show up. God will just leave you. Okay, he'll move on. He'll find somebody else. Okay, praise the Lord. All right, look what 1 John, we'll go quickly here. Each of these points could be a message unto itself, but we don't have that kind of time. So 1 John 5, 21, last verse of the book. Five chapters, fifth chapter, and the last verse, which is verse 21, here's what it says. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourselves from idols. In other words, it's your responsibility, Jack. You can't blame somebody else. It's not Pastor Dan's responsibility, Pastor Jim's responsibility, not mine. I'm responsible for my life, and you're responsible for yours. Amen? That's right. You can't blame anybody else for what's going on in your life. Just look in the mirror. There's the reason why. Get rid of all the idols. Six examples. Okay. Um, look at Proverbs, I'm sorry, Psalms 24. We're going to go quick crisscrossing through the Bible here this evening. Psalms 24 and verse 4. Let's begin with verse 3. Psalms 24 and verse 3. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? How many, interested, how many are interested in standing in God's holy place, ascending God's holy hill? I'd like, to be, I'd like to be included in that group. All right. Who is it then? Verse 4 tells us who is included in that group. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not listen to this, lifted up his soul to an idol or sworn deceitfully. Don't lift up your soul to idols. Tear down these high places in your life. Okay, and everybody's got them. It just might be that yours are different than someone else's. That's why we can't judge each other. Just mind your own business. Amen? Every time you're pointing your finger at somebody else, God will say three more fingers are pointing back at you. Okay, so never mind criticizing or commenting on other people's lives. Just make sure you got your own P's and Q's in order for the Lord. Mind your own business. That's what God tells me. <laughs> so that's what I tell you. All right. Number one. Number one of six. Stumbling blocks. Idols. High places. Money. Money. And everything money can buy. You got to understand something about money. Money is a tool to use to further the kingdom of God. And there is no other reason for money being the exchange that it is on this planet, as far as God's concerned, money. But you have to understand that if you don't get a handle on this, money will rule you rather than you ruling the money, okay? Someone says, well, you know, people are, you know, they, they talk about rich people, poor people, and coveting money. I've seen poor people coveting more money than the rich people. They covet what they don't have. They're always wanting what someone else has. They're always complaining about what they don't have. They're just as guilty as the people that are rich and don't know what to do with what they've got. The Great Commission costs money. You have to have money to reach souls. You have to have money to hold crusades. You have to have money to print flyers. You have to have money to, um, you know, have tent meetings. 
to reach out in meetings like this. You have to have money. You can't just walk up to the counter at Home Depot and tell them you're trying to build a church and you need all these materials back there and they're going to say, you know what, that's a wonderful thing and I hope you're successful, but if you want the two-by-fours and the steel girders and the beams and all of this, behold the price. I can't walk up to the counter at United Airlines and say, I got to fly to the Philippines to hold crusades. And they're going to say, you know, that's a wonderful thing, buddy. But, you know, if you want to fly on that jet back there, behold the price of the ticket. No ticky, no money. No money, no ticky, no ticky, no fly. -y. They don't care about your calling. They don't care about any of that stuff. They want the money. The good news is God's prepared to give you the money. As long as you know what to do with it, he'll give you as much as you need to run your race and finish what God has assigned for you to do. Amen. And if he can trust you with 10,000, he'll give you 100,000. And if he can trust you with 100,000, he'll give you a million. And if he can handle a million, he'll give you 10 million. Someone say amen. amen. Money and all that money can buy. Look with me, if you would, at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Last as we turn to Colossians chapter 3, I'm reminded of something that happened to me last October. Some of you may know, I like two-wheel transportation, bicycles and motorcycles. I've ridden off-road motorcycles for 40 years in the Philippines, and just recently God gifted me with Harley-Davidson's here on this side. So I've been running around with those things, riding around on those, and that's wonderful. And I like to go bike riding, and I've been an avid cyclist, bicyclist for 20 years maybe. Um, and we run, I've run races and things of this nature in my youth, you know, 70 years old, so I'm slowing down a little bit now. Used to do 60, 70-mile rides. Now I do 35-mile rides. But the point is I ride bikes that are expensive bikes to ride. These bikes are $5,000 and up, you know, titanium, all these exotic materials. My bikes, the bikes that you ride in the groups that I ride with, you know, you can pick the bike up with two fingers. They're that light, but they're so strong, you can do downhills at 45 miles an hour, and you are safe, safe and secure on that rig, because if you're not, and you do a, an, an end over going downhill at 45 miles an hour, they'll scoop you up and take you to the cemetery, okay? Well, just last October, I did a ride, you know, I was doing about a 35-mile ride, you know, and I stopped at a, at a convenience store to buy some snacks, you know, because I was kind of spent, you know, I'd hit the wall, you know, and I'm going to replenish and so I parked my light, le, le, lent, leaned, that's what I'm trying to say, leaned my bike up against the wall, went inside to buy my snacks and when I came out my bike was gone. Stolen. I actually made eye contact with the thief. He was coming out of the store as I was coming in. I know who took it and I saw, I saw him. I could see him riding down the road with it. Okay, That bike was $5,000. Okay, So I filed a police report but you know that's worthless. You know, nothing's going to happen for these people. There's other priorities for these guys. You know, I understood that. So I filed the report. But, you know, I told the Lord, I said, I want my bike, I want the value of my bike back. The Bible says in Proverbs, the thief, when the thief takes, you can, t you can uh, require seven times the value of what was stolen from you. So I told the, I told the Lord, I want $35,000 for that bike. I want the bike. I want a bike and I want 35 grand to reimburse me for the thief who just rode off with my bike. Well, you know, just within three weeks, I had a better bike than the one that was stolen from me. I called a pastor friend of mine who's also a cyclist and I, I just told him what had happened and he just happened to have a rig in his garage that he wasn't using, one that's better than mine. So I'm now riding a better bike than the one that got ripped off from me last October. It's faster, it's leaner, it's a better bike and I praise the Lord for it. And I'm waiting for my 35000 and I'm every single day I'm telling the devil, hey, hey Buster, you owe me thirty-five grand for that bike. And by the way, here's something else I claim. I claim the soul of the thief who took it. Every time he touches that bike or pawned it to someone else, everyone who rides it, everyone who touches it will be convicted by the Holy Spirit until they get saved. We're going after the devil's thieves. We're going to claim their souls in Jesus' name, and I'm going to take back $35,000, and I'm riding a better bike. Period. So I'm not going to sit there and feel sorry for myself because my bike was stolen because I know God's got the reserves. Okay? Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 says it this way. Colossians 3, 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Seek the things which are above. 
where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not things on this earth. Not, not, not things here. Everything here is subject to decay and rust. The moment it's built, it starts to fall apart. The moment they repave the highway, it starts to deteriorate. Anything that comes from this earth is cursed because the ground is cursed. Anything that is fabricated from materials that are drawn from the earth is cursed the day they start to work with it because it comes from a cursed ground, from a cursed planet. Everything, anything, cell phones, semiconductors, computers, the whole nine earth, everything begins to decay the moment it's built or fabricated because it comes from a cursed planet. But if you understand that money can be your best friend or money can be your downfall, if you understand this and you use money rather than worshiping it, it doesn't become an idol to you, God will not hesitate to put the money in your pocket to buy the things not only that you need, but the things that you'd like to have. And you won't have to strive, you know, strive for it. He'll hand it to you. He'll give it to you. Amen. I, wanted, I had wanted a Harley Davidson for years. I had wanted, but I just, you know, never got around to, you know, Whatever. And a pastor just called me up one time. It was about three years ago. Just called me up and said, I, I, I have it in my heart to, to sew my Harley to you. It was a Harley V-Ride. It's the racer. It's the drag racer. Which is what, it's kind of the way I am. It's a drag racing bike. And he had it. And he says, I want to just give it to you. I didn't ask him. I didn't tell him anything about it. But he just called me up and said, I want to give it to you. Praise the Lord. So, you know, he found a trailer and they transported it from Florida to Arizona. And I've been riding this thing and I love it, you know. But the point is, see, if you follow after God and if you seek after the things which are above and not down here, the things down here will be handed to you. Jesus said, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things will be given to you, added to you. You won't have to find them. They'll be given to you. God knows where you live, friends. He knows what rings your bell. He knows. He wants to bless you. Jesus died to give you an abundant life, not a barely get along life. But it all t is tied to the fact that you know who you are in Christ, that you're a soldier on military operations for the Lord. In the process of serving the Lord, God will give you all kinds of wonderful things to make your life as enjoyable as it can possibly be. Amen. Yeah, give the Lord a hand clap. He deserves it. Thank you, Jesus. Set your affection on things above. So number one, money and all that money can buy. Number two, and you get into some, uh, you know, dicey territory here, food and drink. Food and drink. Be careful. Be careful with the temple that you live in. You're responsible to take care of it. Okay? And I've had healing lines over the years, and I've had many, many times. I've, been, I've, I've gone to lay hands on people, and the Lord said, don't bother. They're not going to get their healing. They have not judged themselves in the area of food and drink. And until they do, you can lay hands upon them until their hair falls off their head. Nothing's going to happen until they make some lifestyle changes that they need to make. Can anyone say amen to this? All right. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. We're not judging anybody, by the way. We're not criticizing anybody. I'm simply saying you need to make sure that the way you're fueling your body is giving God something to work with rather than slowly and surely over the years killing yourself. Are you listening? Food and drink. Look with me at um, Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23. I want to be a lean, mean fighting machine for Jesus. Lean and mean. And that meant in my life I had to make changes. Okay? I had to make some changes. And if you have to make them, make them. Proverbs 23, verse number 1. Proverbs 23, verse 1. When you sit down to eat with a ruler, consider carefully what is before you. Think about that. Consider carefully what you're about to put into your body, food and drink. And put a knife to your throat if you are a man given to appetite. Do not desire his delicacies because they are deceptive foods. Listen, anything that man makes more than likely is deceptive food. It tastes great going down, but it's going to kill you over time. It's going to kill you over time, okay? Okay. It doesn't happen all at once. I mean, young people can get away with things because they're young. 
They can get away with things. You can have pizza at noon and chocolate cake at 11 p.m. at night when you're 25 years old, and you can get away with some things. When you get older, you'll find out if you're not already there. You'll find out your body is not able to, to process this kind of stuff like it used to. I found out in my life, I'm 70 years old. I found out I can't do the same things at 70 that I was doing at 25. Okay? And again, the donuts don't jump in your mouth. Just saying. I mean, you drive to the donut shop. You put in your order, okay? I know what I'm talking about because I'm de- I have to deal with a donut demon on a regular basis. You know, I've already put in my request. I believe in the new Jerusalem there are going to be donut shops. But until that time, I have a responsibility to keep this flesh under control. And I'll talk to my body. I'll say, you'll not have a dozen donuts today. Maybe one or two. But you're not going to have 12. No, you're not either. Praise the Lord. Food and drink, deceitful dainties. Control your consumption. Nobody else can do this for you but you. Okay? All right. That's number two. Number three. Again, a dicey area, but sexual sins. Be very careful about how you handle sex in your life. Sexual sins. I cannot tell you how many pastors have fallen because they couldn't control themselves with their carnal appetites. Okay, And if you're sitting there and you know that things are out of order in your life sexually, you need to judge yourself before judgment falls on you. Because God is very gracious and he's very patient. But there comes a time when the line is drawn and judgment is given. And the protection is withdrawn. And the devil has a free shot at you. And let me tell you something. If you open your door and you give the devil a free shot at you, he'll take it. Don't give him free ammunition. He'll take you up on the offer. And he'll shoot away. Okay, keep your guard up. Guard yourself. Okay, guard yourself. And if you're, if you're prone to certain things that you know are sexually sinful, you need to monitor that and stay on top of that every single day. Because, again, like I said earlier, what someone else might struggle with sitting next to you might not be your problem, but that's, you know, but you might have something else that you're dealing with in your life. Okay? Not everybody has the same issues, but everybody has issues. Okay? Possess your body in sanctification and honor. This was a main theme in the Apostle Paul's epistles. He wanted those people to understand the importance of sexual purity. Sexual purity. Okay? Look with me, if you would, at 1 Corinthians. This is just example, one example of what I'm referring to here. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 9. We'll read just a few verses. Okay? 1 Corinthians 5, 9, he writes to the, e, uh, to the Corinthians, he says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Listen to that. Don't keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners, idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But, verse 11, but now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. He's telling these people, you better be very selective about who your friends are. And if these people are struggling with sexual problems, they're going to pull you in if you don't cut them off. Amen. Like I said, choose your friends carefully. You know, you can be friendly with lots of people because we're charged to go into all the world and reach... Reach souls. So you can be friendly with many people, but your list of friends needs to be very, very short and select. And you need to make sure that the people that you're opening your soul to in your life are people that have their own act together in these particular areas. Okay? And you need to hold each other accountable. You know, there's uh, accountability groups and all this. Whatever it takes, honey, if you're struggling with pornography, if you're struggling with lust of some kind, you need to recognize the problem and deal with it. And you need to go talk to somebody, someone here at the church that can help you overcome the lust and the temptation. It's not, it, you know, so what? Everybody struggles with certain things. You know, don't be ashamed to say, I got a problem. I got a problem here. And deal with it so that you can move on from it and you can be used by God. Remember, who wants to ascend God's holy hill? He with clean hands. And a pure heart. Well, he made our hearts pure, but the hands, that's completely up to us, whether they're clean or not. 
the lives we live and the choices we make. So that's number three, sexual sins. All right, number four, moving on for time quickly. Galatians 1.10. These are all high places. This is what we're talking about, high places that you need to pull down. Okay, like Jesus put them all out, you need to put them out of your life. Okay, so that you can run your race just as sharp as you can possibly run it. All right, this is Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 10. Paul writes to the Galatian church here, and he says, Do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Number four, here's the high place, social acceptance over divine approval. Okay? Please God, never mind pleasing men. You're going to please some and you're going to tick a bunch of them off. It doesn't matter. Okay? I frankly don't care what people think about me. I'm tempted to because we have feelings just like everybody else. You know, you want to be liked by people. It feels good to be liked and appreciated. But at the end of the day, if you hate my guts, it doesn't matter to me because I'm not answering to you. I'm answering to Jesus, and so are you. So if people don't like you, so what? The world hasn't ended, so they don't like you. So move on. Find some new people to work with. Find some new people to reach out to. If these people are stupid enough to drop you and you're trying to help them, then move on. If you offend people, move on. Don't sit there with your feelings out in your shirt sleeves feeling sorry for yourself. Pick up your weapons and re-engage the enemy and move on. And if these people grow a brain at some point and realize that you were really trying to help them, then fine, you can receive them back in a fellowship at some point in the future. But until then time, dump them. Love them and dump them in the name of Jesus. I want God's approval. I don't really need yours and you don't need mine. I want God to say, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm not going to stand before your judgment seat. You're not going to stand before mine. So it doesn't matter what I think about your life. And it doesn't matter what you think about mine. What matters is, does Jesus like what's going on in my life? Is he pleased with the life I live? Is he pleased with the thoughts I think and the words that come out my mouth? Am I as sharp of a soldier as he needs for me to be? And if I am, then I frankly don't care about what other people think or say. Look at 1 Corinthians Chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 3. 1 Corinthians 4, 3, here's what it says. Paul writes, he's talking about the critics in the Corinthian church. They didn't like him. They didn't like him. They thought, you know, who are you? You're not really an apostle. You know, we don't think you're, you're worthy of, you're qualified to lead us, etc. So he's going he's to address them. He says in 1 Corinthians 4, 3, But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. He says, with me, it's a very small thing that you judge me. I frankly don't care. If you go back and read, you know, he says, listen, the Holy Spirit sent me to Corinth. I'm going to stay as long as, he, as long as he tells me to stay. I don't care what you think about it. You can like me or hate me. I frankly don't care. I'll stay as long as he tells me to stay. I'll do what he tells me to do while I'm here. And when he tells me to leave, then I'll leave. Until then, shut up and listen to what I have to say. Because I'm talking to you and I need for you to pay attention to what's going on. I need to make sure you know that there's a heaven and there's a hell. And you're going to one or the other. That's why I'm here. And if you're smart enough to listen... And do what I'm telling you to do, you'll end up in heaven for all eternity rather than in a lake of fire forever and ever. That's the straight up message that people need to hear. Amen. The world needs to know. You know what, buddy? There's a heaven, there's a hell, and you're going to one or the other. Doesn't matter whether you're an American or Filipino, educated or uneducated, rich or poor, it doesn't matter. Every human being born is going to spend eternity in one of two places, heaven or hell. You and I, we will go. Wherever we go, when we step out of this body, we go forever. There are no parole board hearings in hell. They're gone. They're gone forever. You need to wrap your mind around the concept of eternity. Number five, quickly. Revelation 3.16. I've already made mention of this, so this one will be quick. Revelation 3.16. Uh, verse 15, we'll start with the 15th verse. Revelation 3, 15, Jesus is the speaker. He says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. 
I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Number five, lukewarm Christianity. The Sunday morning believers, the ones who show up every so often, once in a while, once every month, stuff like this. I'm telling you, like I said a few minutes ago, if you're living your life like that, honey, you're going to fall. You're going to get run over and steamrolled by the world all around you. We can no longer cruise on someone else's revelation anymore. You better know who you are in Christ. And if this church goes away and blows away, you'll stand. If you're the last man standing, you will stand because you have no compromise in your life. You can't stand the sin of mediocrity, and you're going to be a man that God can depend on under fire no matter what kind of hell you're going. Going through. Amen. And your wife will thank God she's married to you. And your children will thank God that you held them, their fat to the fire and disciplined them and brought them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, even though at school it wasn't the popular thing to do. Frankly, I could care less what they're teaching in school now, by the way, anyways, of the devil to start with. Pray for the people who are lukewarm. Don't make friends with them, but pray for them. Okay? Quickly. Psalms 101. Again, we could read all of Psalms 101, but we don't have that kind of time. But I'll pull a verse out for you from that psalm. Psalms 101. And verse number 3. You want to know why David was a man after God's own heart? Read this psalm. You can also put down Psalms 26. We don't have time to go there. Put down that one too and read that later. You want to know why David was a man after God's own heart? Read this psalm. Among other verses, here's one, verse 3. He says, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart, verse 4, shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness, verse 5. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. Then verse number 6. My eyes shall be on the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way, he shall serve me. That man had a very short list of friends. And he just describes who can hang with him and who he doesn't want anywhere near him. And that's the kind of mentality you and I need to have in these last days. It's up to you, okay? I tell the soldiers overseas, it's up to you. Whether you come back from operations or not, you know, I mean, and, you know, people say, well, how come, how, why is it you're so hard on these soldiers? And I tell them, I said, because if you're on the battlefield and I have to scoop up your dead guts and drag you back to the base... Because you weren't prepared for the encounter that you, you know, found yourself in the middle of. It won't, I'll know, it won't be because I didn't train you. It won't be my fault. So I'm going to push you and I'm going to hold you fat to the fire. And I'm going to make sure that if you go out there, I've done everything I know to do to prepare you to come back alive. And to give a good account of yourself wherever you're sent in the name of the government that you say you represent. You better know how to use your weapons. You better know what happens if you get hit, how you can handle this. You better understand all of this. Or we're going to be dragging your body back home in a bag and writing letters home to your family. Number six, last of all, social media. Social media. You know, 15 years ago, there was no social media. But in the last 10 to 15 years, that, that monster has taken over the planet. Social media. I mean, I, I see pastors, I see people with phones in front of their face 24 hours a day. They eat with the phone next to them. They, they're text messaging while they're eating. They're driving while they're text messaging. I mean, all, it, it's all about social media. Listen, you got to understand, you know, you can use social media. You know, our church here uses it. Our ministry uses it, okay? But at the same time, you can't get sucked into this thing with all the links and all the, the side journeys where people are sending you all this stuff where you end up, where before you know it, three hours have passed and all you're doing is looking at links and listening to people's videos and all of this stuff. Listen, you got to put a lid on this stuff 
in the name of Jesus. It's okay once in a while to check things out to understand a little bit what's going on. But at the end of the day, shut it off and open up your Bible and start communing with the Lord instead of wasting all your time on some social media platform. Some would say amen. amen. Praise the Lord. You know, monitor these things, okay? Let me finish with something God gave me in 1984, and I've carried it with me ever since. Because I went overseas, and I've, I found out real quick, if I don't know who I am, they're going to send me home in a coffin. Because in the Philippines, man, there's witch doctors, there's communist rebels, there's Muslim rebels. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff out there that when you go out into the field, you better know who you are in Christ. And I found out I can no longer cruise on Kenneth Hagin's revelation, Rama's revelation. I better know who I am because they're not there anymore. I'm out there, and I'm out there alone. There's no ministry of helps. There's no ushers. I mean, when the witch doctor comes up and, you know, starts to shut your meeting down by putting spells on people on the front row, you better know who you are in Christ. It's not the time to go behind the palm tree and pray in tongues for 15 minutes for guidance from God. You come out from behind the palm tree, the first four rows are sick and dying. You know, that's not a very good crusade witness. Just saying. Well, I found out. And then the Lord helped me. He said, I'm going to give you seven, what he called priorities of life. Seven. I'm giving them to you. It's a message. I don't have time for this, but I'll give you the seven. Okay. There are seven things. Write these down because this is how you spend your time every day. These are the seven. And they're given in descending order of importance, meaning number one is more important than number two. Number two is more important than number three, on down to number seven. They're all important, but in relation to each other, one is more important than two, on down to seven. Number one, worship. Worship. Number two, praise. Worship and praise are not the same. They go together, but they are distinctly different. You worship God for who he is. You praise God for what he does. Okay? Worship, you worship him. That's why it's number one. He deserves the worship just because he is. And we praise him for what he's doing and what he's done and what he's going to do. That's number two. Number three, prayer. Spend more time praying. I'm so busy. Well, then change your schedule. Because if you're too busy, then your priorities are screwed up and you need to change your priorities. Okay, worship number one, praise number two, prayer number three, number four, confession. We're not talking about the Catholic concept of confession. We're talking about confessing the word of God, speaking it out your mouth and listening to what you have to say. Because faith comes by hearing. So hear yourself speak it and let the faith be deposited in your heart as a result. That's number four. Number five, meditation. Meditation. Spend time meditating in the scripture, thinking about what you're reading. Number five, number six, study and reading. Don't just read the Bible, study it when you read it, okay? It doesn't do any good to read the Bible through in a year if you don't know what you read. All these, you know, read the Bible through the year program, that's great. If, did, you, did you, you know, digest any information? Are you walking it out? Okay, and then number seven, sharing, or what we commonly call witnessing. Talking to people about Jesus. But notice number seven is number seven. That's the last on the list. You better take care of one through six before you try to go out and witness because if you don't take care of one through six, you got nothing to say to people that they need to hear. You'll be just as screwed up as the people you're trying to reach. Okay? You spend time with the Lord. Priorities one, two, and three is relationship. Four, five, and six is education. You got to fill your heart with knowledge in order to share something. Wisdom is the release of knowledge. Knowledge is the acquisition of information, and wisdom is the release of it. Okay? But you got to spend time with God. Get to know his voice. Spend time with the Holy Ghost. Pray in other tongues. All these things. Okay? And then finally you can share. All right? At the end of the day, men, you need to step up to the plate and be who you can be in Christ. Okay? You cannot anymore just cruise into church every so often. You, you know, we're way past this now. You can get by with this stuff in the 80s and 90s, but they are pushing the envelope now. They hate Jesus. They hate Christ. They hate the church. They hate Israel. They hate America. They hate you, and they're not ashamed to say it anymore, and they're going to try to 
brainwash people and change people, and you and I are the firewall that's going to prevent this. America is going to go down at some point because prophetically it has to go down because the one world government has to rise, and as long as America's here, it can't rise as long as we're here as we presently exist. So we will go down at some point, but the radical remnant, which is you and which is me, we can delay the demise of this country. Judgment can be delayed to give us more time to win souls. Amen. And if I've got anything to say about it, I'm going to delay this as long as I can because we got to hold more crusades. we got to travel farther and faster for Jesus. you got to be a player and not just a spectator anymore. Praise the Lord. you got to go home and say, you know, I'm done being just a mediocre Christian. I'm tired of being tired. I'm going to make a difference. My life is going to count for something from this day on. I'm going to be a player and no longer a spectator, a participant, not a commentator from now on. From now on. Amen. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word of God. I pray to God that I've said something here that rings a bell, that resonates in the hearts and minds of all these men. God bless these people. Such potential in this room. Such potential in this room. Help them understand, Father, that as they ask you to forgive them for mediocrity or lethargy or laziness or apathy, that you will forgive them. And as far as you're concerned, it's, it's done. It's washed under the blood. It's gone. Let's move on. Let's start again. Let's start fresh. Help them understand that when, you, when they confess these sins, that you're, they're forgiven. There's no strings attached here, that we can move on from this day right now and we can get involved. Pastor Dan, Lord, was talking about volunteers that they needed the church. Well, let some people stand up and be counted. Let some people stand up and get in the game. And Lord, we thank you that we're going to make our lives count. From this day forward, our lives are going to matter to you. They're going to matter to the kingdom of God, and they're going to matter to the race that we're supposed to run in Jesus' name. Now, if you're here tonight, and I know that some hands went up because you're here as a guest or this is your first time, thank you for coming. And I got news. What you got here tonight, you're going to get every single week if you come back to this church. The leadership of this church does not compromise excellence in Christ. And you're going to be fed and blessed and encouraged and held to the fire. You know, you'll be challenged. You might even be rebuked or corrected from time to time. Whatever it takes to keep your sword sharp, we're going to keep it sharp for you. But if you're here tonight and you're not ready to meet Jesus, as I've mentioned several times during this message, people are going to go to heaven or people are going to go to hell. And everybody in hell... Every single soul that's suffering in the fire right now, if they had one more chance to give their heart to Jesus, they'd do it in 15 seconds or less. They'd be gone. They'd say, Jesus, yes, you're my Lord. You're my Lord. I'm so sorry. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Well, they'll never get that chance. Free will is only a reality as long as you live in this body. This body is your temple. As long as you live inside of this body, you have the power of choice. But when you step out from this body, choice is removed from you. You don't choose anymore. When you step out of your body upon death, they bury your body. They don't bury you. You go to where you chose to go while you lived inside of your body. They'll bury the body, but they're not going to bury you. The choices you make in this life determine where you go when you step out of this body because the body is just your suitcase. The real you is on the inside. The real you is on the inside. All right. So while we're here tonight, let's just settle the deal right now. Let's all stand. We've been sitting for a little while. Let's all stand. If you're here tonight and you know, you know that you've been cruising and mediocrity has been the, the, the order of the day for you. Compromise, mediocrity, lethar, lethargic, apathetic Christianity. If that's you, then you're going to change tonight. And if you're here tonight and you've never accepted Jesus, this is your golden moment right now to turn things around and give God a life to work with and shut the devil and cut him off from your life once and for all. All right? So I'm going to count to three. When I count to three... You put your hand up if I'm talking to you, okay? Don't be ashamed about it. Listen, we've all had to make adjustments. I've had to make mine, and I'm going to challenge you to make yours. And there's no better time to do that than right now. This church need the, needs the men of the church to be men of God, to be men among them. And that's completely up to you, completely up to you, all right? 
at the count of three. All you do is you put your hand up at the count of three. You know, you hear three, put your hand up. Make a choice, okay? Because you're choosing to turn your life around. Never mind the person next to you. Never mind. You take care of your life, okay? At the count of three. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. I don't want anybody looking around, seeing whose hand goes up. You mind your own business, okay? It's a choice. It's not a feeling. When I reach three, make a choice. Okay, this is it for me. I'm tired of being lethargic. I'm tired of being beat up. I'm tired of being run over by the devil. I'm tired of being pushed around. I am going to be what God ordained for me to be from this day forward. That's it. There's no compromise anymore in my life. Praise the Lord. At the count of three, put your hand up if I'm talking to you. Either you've never accepted Jesus or you need to come back to your first love and get serious about serving the Lord instead of serving yourself. Okay? One, two, three. Hands up if I'm talking to you. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh my gosh, too many to count. Many, many hands. God bless. God bless. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. All right. If your hand is up, then you know why. I don't need to know. I'm not your God. It's none of my business. But if your hand went up, I want you to come right down to this altar right now. Be bold. Get out from where you're standing. Come right down here right now and let us rejoice with you. Come on down here. If you put your hand up, you know why. Okay? Don't be, you know, don't be shy about it. Come on down here. Come on. Come on, men. Come on, guys. Come on, guys. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Thank you, Father. Let this be the golden moment in your life. Amen. And if you're watching online, if you can stand up to wherever you're going to be, then you make that decision too. Just because you're at home doesn't mean you're excluded. You can be included too. All right, get off your couch and get serious about serving the Lord. Put down the Twinkies and pick up your Bible and start serving the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come on down, guys. This is your golden moment. This is a wonderful sight in the sight of God right here. You guys are going to turn hell upside down. You're going to be warriors for Jesus, okay? There's no telling what God's going to use you to do. And like I said a few minutes ago, never mind the past. You're getting your heart cleaned and cleared tonight, and you're going to leave this place ready to go for God, okay? No matter what you've done, no matter what you've been doing, you leave it with Jesus right here, right now. He'll wash you and clean you and, and work with you and start building up a life that God can be proud to bless. Amen? All right. Say this out loud. Everybody together, we're going to talk to Jesus. You're going to talk to Jesus for a minute with me. I'll lead you, and you follow me. You're not talking to me, but we're talking to the Lord, and I'm just leading you, okay? Your conversation's with the Lord, not with me. But I want everybody in this building to say the same things that these men are saying to support them for what they're doing right now. These, these are a, a bunch of frontline fighters about to be unleashed into the world in the name of Jesus. So let's say this out loud to the Lord. Listen, if you can shout a scream and scream at a football game and you don't care what people think, let's let the devil hear you from five blocks down the road when we make our declarations to the Lord. Let him know we're serious about this. All right, so you guys, you're talking to the Lord. Everybody say this out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus I, come to you tonight, I come to you tonight, and I believe, I believe that you are the Christ, the, Christ the, Son God, the Son of God, that you died on a cross, cross paid for my sins, for my sins and, rose and rose from the dead. So tonight, I make my choice, and from now on, I serve you and you alone. I'm tired of being compromised, but I make my choice, and for the rest of my life, I serve you and you alone. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me, forgiving me, and loving me, and I leave behind all my sins. I receive my forgiveness, and I'm never looking back. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's give these guys a hand. Amen. Hua. 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 Amen. Amen. We're
Pastor Mike. Ah, all right. Everybody turn and look at this fine gentleman here. This is Pastor Mike. He will help you. I want you to go with him for a few minutes, okay? This is a debriefing, okay? We're going to tell you about what you just did, help you understand the magnitude of the moment, and give you some resources to help you start your walk with God, okay? Your friends will wait for you. This isn't going to take long, but I want you to go with him right now, please, and just let him be a blessing to you. We've got trained people that will help you. Please go turn to the left and follow Pastor Mike. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Before Pastor Dan comes to wrap this up, by the way, was this a help to anybody? Was it? Uh, okay, good, 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 good. You should say to the devil every time you wake up in the morning, I'm one day closer to seeing Jesus, and I'm coming after you. Amen. All right, some things we brought. If you found this message to be a message that resonates with you, I brought, I handpicked some things. We've got other things, but um, this is the stuff that would really complement the message you heard tonight. It's not the message, but it complements the message you heard tonight. If you like to listen, if you are a listener, you've got CDs. This is also in a USB flash drive format if you're so inclined. Exhausted pursuit. Don't quit. Don't ever quit. Don't ever think about quitting. Quitting is not in your vocabulary. When you run your race for the Lord, you will. there will be times when you're spiritually exhausted and ready to quit. Don't give up, ever. That's not in your vocabulary. You will run your race. You might be bleeding and on your face, but keep moving forward. This will help you get there and stay there. The other one, there is power, the power of your purpose. You have a purpose in life. And this is from the book of Acts. Seven things from Acts 22.10 that you need to know that's going to guarantee, guarantee your success as you run your race for the Lord. Those things are there. And if you are a reader, if you like to read, this is the first book. I mentioned the seven priorities. This is in this book here. Be strong, stay strong. That's in this book. And these little guys, that we, the last two books were uh, small books. Pastor Jim encouraged us to write this one, Determined Faith. Determined faith. You got to be determined to get what God gave you. Your faith is out there, but you got to hang in there until all the roadblocks are cleared in the name of Jesus. All the barricades are moved out of the way. You got to have determination. These little books can be read in 60 minutes or less, but they will change your life. And what I talked about tonight the radical remnant. You and I are the part of the remnant that God can work with. Amen. We are the sharp end of the stick. We are the frontline fighters. We are the ones, we are the point people. We are the special forces that get dropped in behind enemy lines to do the covert work that the rank and file soldier is unable to take care of because we are the ones who know who we are and where we're going and the fact that we'll never be left out on the battlefield. God will never leave us nor forsake us. So all that's available out there. Help yourself to these things. And God bless you guys. Amen and amen. Let's be men of God, men of God. Pastor Dan. Amen. That was so good. I am so blessed by that word, Mike. Just thank you so much for bringing that to us. Did you guys enjoy the word of the Lord tonight? Wasn't that awesome? He's still going. Man, it's awesome. Well, we're, we've got Mike tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., Sunday morning at 9 and 11, and Sunday night we are having a healing service here in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. So come and join us again. Bring your wives, bring your children with you, all right? We're going to have a great time in church this weekend. And remember, on your way out, to not only uh, grab one of these cards, we've got one black, one white, right? Bunker groups for those of you looking to get into accountability, fellowship, that sort of thing with other men, that small group, and, and then as well, interest cards. Serve somewhere. Talking about purpose and that sort of a thing. God made you to work. You are strong for a reason. And so God has plans for you. So grab one of these on your way out and then go see Mike's table. He has those books for sale. That helps him to continue to preach the gospel and do what Mike does in the Philippines as well. As, like I said, in other parts of the world, God has been expanding their ministry and doing some great things. And so uh, that will bless him in the ministry, but also it will bless you in your walk with God. We get great teaching here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. And when you listen to guys like Mike and read their books, it will skyrocket you into new arenas and to think new thoughts and explain things in different ways. You know, as much as God has gifted me to teach, Mike 
comes in and says something, you go, that makes sense, man. He just said it so blunt and so up front. I get it now. You know what I mean? And so that will encourage you in your walk with God, all right? So don't run off. Make sure to make a friend before you leave this place. And I did want to mention this. I know we talked about tacos and all that kind of stuff. But the guys that came early got all the food, literally ate them completely out. And so the Montejano said, we can't get prep time and stuff in time for the, the, the men as they come out. So there will not be tacos and burritos for sale here at the church. So if you get a, a band of brothers and you want to go on a mission and go witness at Del Taco or something, you know what I mean, or in and out you can do that, okay? So that's up to you. But make sure to make a friend on your way out. Say hi to somebody. Let me bless you as we go. Would you lift your hands? Lord, Father, I bless the men of God here tonight, God. I thank you that they will lead their homes well, that they will be the husbands, the fathers, the brothers, the sons that they need to be, God, that they will be the leaders in community, in business, Father God, in, in, in witness, Lord, and in holy living, God, that these are men of God called by your name. And we thank you, God, as we live our lives out loud on purpose and in faith, that the Inland Empire will be changed. And we declare that the Inland Empire Empire shall be saved. Hey there, thank you so much for joining us online. What a blast getting to do church with all of you. If you just gave your heart to Jesus and prayed the salvation prayer with our pastor, congratulations and welcome to the family of God. Here at The Rock, we wanna get you plugged in and set up for success as you start this new walk. In a moment, I'd like you to head to our Respond to God page so you can fill out some information and we can get in touch with you. We not only wanna send you some free material, we'd also like to get you hooked up with a friend who can help guide you through your new walk with Jesus. We have multiple friends available that would love to meet with you via a Zoom chat, a phone call, maybe an email, or any type of COVID-friendly interaction, they wanna meet with you. We have this wonderful little booklet called Welcome to Your Destiny, Easy Steps to a Successful Future with God. Now, if you live in the continental United States, we'd love to mail you this copy, this paper copy, and get it in your hands. If you don't live nearby, don't even worry about it. We also have electronic copies available in PDF format. We would love to send your way. We also have this fun little comic book we'd love to send to any kids out there that just gave their heart to Jesus as well. This book is super fun. It helps explain their walk with God in a fun, age-friendly way that they can understand. So now what I'd like you to do, I'd like you to click on the link provided below. Now, if you can't find the link, it's okay. We're gonna send you to our webpage. We'd like you to go to rockchurch.com and click on the Respond to God tab in the bottom right-hand corner. This is gonna send you to a new page where we can get your information so we can send you a free copy of either one of these fun guys. And we can also get you hooked up with a great friend who will help you walk through these next steps. Well, it was so great hearing the word of God with you today. We can't wait to see you at our next service. And don't forget, God loves you and so do we.